wonderful scuba divers out there. Welcome to Scuba Diving Magazine and welcome to Ask Mark, which is a scuba diving Q&A. Uh, I am Mark and uh, I'm a former dive instructor. And whilst I don't teach scuba diving anymore, I like to answer your scuba diving questions online and help you out as much as I can. So if you have any questions, pop them down in the comments and use the Ask Mark hashtag to get featured in the next Q&A. This week, I'm answering questions about mixing backplate brands, dry suit buoyancy, uh, thigh pockets, every dive carry, bit of EDC there, um, finger spools and O-rings. So let's dive straight in with the first question. Which this week comes from user James Collins and they say, Hi Mark, congratulations on your move from Simply, thank you. I think you have both of them. Uh, so can you fit an Apex WTX wing on an X Deep Zen backplate? Um, close, I have, I definitely have an Apex wing. Um, and I suppose I have the next best thing, which is actually a, um, a bladder from uh, an X Deep Ghost, um, which does have the uh, the whole perforations in them. Uh, so I can basically measure all of those and make sure that they line up. Um, yes, yeah, so this is this is a long. Um, uh, trying to think of the word, a uh, long-term kind of like thing of whether this brand's backplate marries up with this brand wing. And for some Apex wings, not this one, unfortunately, instead of having uh, multiple grommets cut into it, it actually has a lower slot. So it's, uh, it makes your life a little bit easier. I think on the, um, on the Zen backplates, you do have a slot, which immediately makes your life a little bit easier. Um, but I'll measure them up just so, um, uh, just so that you know. So, oh, center to center, from top hole to the, uh, to the third hole, that is center to center, two, seven, six mil uh, and then the second hole to the fourth is touch longer two seven seven maybe whereas on the um on the ghost i know it's uh, sort of not exactly the same but it's the best that i have um so you have everything from it's true you've got seven holes uh, six of which seem to be um, made for bolting onto the uh, onto the back plate. So you have one at 28 centimeters and one at 30.5. So hopefully they can uh, line up. Otherwise you can have 20, 25, six, and again, 28. So you do have some, um, some options, but with the Zen, I think the Zen, I'll bring up a picture of the Zen down at the bottom. I think it's got a, um, a slot that instead of a, an actual fixed hole, just to make your life a little bit easier when you're trying to marry up um, uh, grommets. So I think you should be fine. Fredder one says, Mark, on a different channel, <laughs> on a different channel, um, you reviewed the Santi Flex 190 dry suit undergarment. Uh, I liked what I saw and I bought it for my first dry suit experience. Uh, in a seven mil with a steel 100 tank, I normally dive with 18 pounds of lead, about eight kilos. With my dry suit and the Santi, it's taking me 38 pounds, 17 kilos to get barely negative. Uh, this sounds excessive, but I don't know anyone who uses this on undergarment can one undergarment like this require nine kilos. Uh, if not, any thoughts on why I would need so much extra weight when switching from wet to dry? I think that's more the um, uh, the issue here is that you're switching from wet to dry instead of the, the dry suit undersuit. I'll wager that you're probably in a neoprene dry suit as well, which in itself is, uh, is much more buoyant. So going from a wet suit where the main buoyancy is in the, the, the foam material to a dry suit, where now you have a constant layer of air all over your body, that is much more buoyant compared to the, the foam of the neoprene. And if you've got a, a chunky neoprene dry suit as well, uh, instead of a membrane dry suit, then you've just got much more to you, which is again, more buoyant. Um, so yeah, switching from wetsuit to dry suit, you do need a lot more lead because it's insulating. The, um, uh, the Flex 190 is relatively thin. Um, it's not quite big, 
bulky, fluffy that you do get some um, like real heavy weight dry suit undersuits, then you do need a lot more lead. Um, but yeah, it's not unusual to need a decent amount of lead. Nine kilos is quite a lot. Um, but yeah, switching from wet to dry suit will do that. Um, it was the um, the waterproof D1, the one with that like internal dry suit undersuit. A buddy of mine bought one of those and um, and yeah, just because it is creating that extra layer of insulating air, it's only a few mil thick, uh, but it's all over you and all of that literally adds up and it does need a lot of lead to actually help you get down. So yeah, it's not unusual to need a bit more lead, quite a bit more lead uh, when you go from wet to a dry suit. Jeff Lemoyne asks, I have watched your reviews on equipment like the fourth element and apex shorts, uh, but I have not found any consideration for holster style shorts. Uh, I find the concept of the off-brand Tongina cargo short wetsuit pants with pockets intriguing for warmer water destinations. Uh, what do you think of this option if there is no need for the added thermal protection? They're fine. Um, my, my first instinct is crotchless pants because that's basically what they are. Um, so instead of having a full pair of neoprene shorts, you basically have the, the crotch section missing um, and the, the lower section on the bottom of the thigh is Velcroed and yeah, you get thigh pockets. They're fine. Um, the, there's nothing particularly wrong with them. It's just, yeah, a lot of the, the designs are... Um, they're, they're, they're taken up by, I can't think of the word, but those, those kind of like brands that do a little bit of everything. And it's it's the same design, just with a different logo on it. There's nothing particularly wrong with them. They definitely do the job, um, but it's not the, the highest standard. It's not the like fourth element or the apex kind of build quality, but yeah, they, they definitely do the job. And thigh pockets do make a world of difference. They do allow for greater storage and more practical storage as well. We used to sell one, it was made by IST um, in those crotchless um, holster style pants. And um, yeah, they, they were quite popular and yeah, they, they do the job. So um, yeah, if, if you are in the market for a new pair of like tech shorts as it were, it is worth consideration. Um, but for me, it's down to the like pocket style. The style was always just neoprene. So it's it's soft and a bit squishy, which does, it, it works. Um, but with like the the fourth element ones, they're, they're a bit more robust and a bit more like straight as it were, um, straight and organized. And the, I think the IST ones had a zippered opening. I'm not a huge fan of zippered openings because it means you have to zipper them closed. It's not the end of the world, but it's just an additional task for you to do um, whilst you then have something in your hands. But for basic use in warmer climates, yeah, they're, they're perfectly fine. Castel Skrull um, says, what things specifically do you always take on every dive in every situation? Um, right, so my, my, my EDC, my every dive carry, um, Again, going back to uh, to thigh pockets is usually the uh, the best way to uh, sort of think about it. So starting off, I always have a, a backup dive mask um, just in case. It's all because on one dive, we um, there there were effectively two groups of us. Uh, there was like the main group and then just three um, divers. We were going through the uh, the swim through in Elphinstone, and then we met up with the uh, with the group later on, and one of the um, uh, one of the people, one of the divers, just a lens of their mask just went and just disappeared. So, of course, you can't clear it. And without a completely separate mask, that's that's it. You you have to continue the, the end of the dive completely blind. Uh, well, not completely blind, but without being able to uh, to see. So, um, so I always dive with a, a backup dive mask because it just eliminates that problem because as soon as it comes off, you just, okay, bum, bum, here's a backup mask, put that on. Okay, it might not fit properly, but you're just gonna get a bit of water in your nose. My one, you might be able to see, it has one of those um, those films in it, those anti-fog films and touch wood, it does the job. But because I'm not like defogging it before every single dive, it, 
it helps um, if you need to uh, to swap over to it. So a backup dive mask, a, uh, a DSMB and a spool, just an essential piece of safety equipment. Uh, when you're on the surface, people can see you far easier if you've got a, a great big red sausage just sticking out of the water. So that makes your life a lot easier. And of course a spool to be able to send it up. Um, a compass. Um, I quite like analog compasses. Um, I, I just, mainly because digital ones, digital ones are fine, um, but they do need like recalibrating from time to time, which can be a bit of a pain. And, um, and you, you never quite know what's like affecting it um, because they don't move in the same way that a, a physical analog compass will. So it's quite nice to be able to, uh, to have that compass and see it like moving. You know there's, um, that it's pointing north and it's, yeah, it is quite intuitive. So I usually have a, a compass with me as well. Um, a cutting device some kind of um, cutting tool. Not always this one. I do like this one. Uh, this is a Scuba Pro Mako. Um, it's titanium. So it's a single piece of titanium. It's not ridiculously big or ridiculously pointy neither. It's a, it's a tanto point, but it is a point. Um, but for, for most for most things that you're gonna encounter underwater, fishing line or something, it's enough. If I'm going in for something a bit more substantial, then of course I'll bring a different tool. Um, but yeah, this one usually comes with me on every dive. And I don't know why, but it's got a bottle opener. For some reason, the, um, the manufacturers seem to think that scuba divers drink a lot. Um, a torch. Torch is always essential, even if you don't use it, because just like poking in and looking under things and, um, in the in the unlikely events that you are like lost at sea at night um it's going to help you get seen as much as that um uh, that dsmb because a light shining out um is much easier to see so um yeah i usually carry a, a torch with me nothing overly um big or bulky because it just like gets in the way but that's usually clipped off onto a uh, onto a onto my harness or something so i can get to that nice and easy um Double ender, I usually carry at least one extra double ender just because um, for emotional support, but also for just things. Cause you, you can fumble a, a double ender, especially if you're wearing gloves. Um, so then like reusing the spool and whatnot, it's much easier if you have an extra double ender. But um, that's, that's probably about it. That comes with me on every single dive. Um, and then on from that, it just, it's dive specific. So uh, an extra primary dive torch or a, a larger size spool or something, depending on, um, on what's actually going on or planned during that dive. But for most dives, that's probably about it. Jay asks, hi Mark, I'm looking for a 15 meter spool, either Apex Lifeline or the Scuba Pro S-Tech Spinner. Uh, any advice would be appreciated. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, this is um, this is new. Uh, the Scuba Pro S-Tech Spinner um, uh, finger spools, I think you probably still call it. And um, I'm, I'm glad that they mentioned it in their videos that it was inspired by the, um, uh, the fidget spinner craze. Uh, so instead of a a standard um, finger spool like that. This is the old design of the um, uh, of the lifeline. Instead of having that like central hole, they they effectively filled it and they have two discs. Um, I'll see if I can find a video and I'll I'll put it up in the corner. And um, you have two discs and like a central. Um, like spindle basically. And it allows the, um, the actual spool itself to rotate, um, which instead of, what they were basically finding was that divers who use that kind of pinch grip, as the DSMB shot up to the surface, that rotation would kind of grip and then rotate and flip the spool out of their fingers and they lose it. So, um, so they were trying to figure out a, a way of eliminating that issue. And it was about the same time we had that fidget spinner craze for, um, for however long that lasted. So they have these two discs 
that it's free to rotate. So there's there's no like rotational force acting on the uh, the finger grip. So the spool is free to uh, free to spin. But if you want to slow it down, you can kind of pinch those two discs together a bit like disc brakes and it would slow it down. So that's the, the sort of the new concept. Um, choosing between the two, it, it comes down to um, like your, your personal preference on not failure points, but moving parts. So the, the lifeline spool, uh, it's it's made out of aluminium, uh, so it's a bit stronger because the uh, the spinners are plastic, I believe. I haven't actually held one, um, but from what I can see online, they look like they're made out of um, uh, just plastic. Um, so th there, it comes into um, whether you want something that's just going to last forever. Um, but is a bit more expensive, or um, something that's, that's sort of plastic. They're not fragile, but they're a bit more fragile. And um, and then you have yeah the, the moving parts of that actual mechanism. You can disassemble it uh, because there's different color kits and stuff. Uh, so I imagine you can disassemble it and then like clean it thoroughly. That would be my main concern of the uh, the spinner, making sure that you can disassemble it, um, so you can maintain it really um but otherwise uh, yeah th they're both very simple designs i myself i use the uh, the lifeline just because i like that they're just bright colorful strong and uh, and they last forever the new versions uh, yeah they, they've had some slight upgrades on like the the external sides but otherwise it's pretty much the uh, the same thing you get the same line and everything um which works perfectly fine otherwise yeah, they're, they're they're both good. So again, you're 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 onto a winner either way you go. It's uh, it's just down to that uh, that mechanism. Um, I think you can disassemble it, so um, so you can like clean it and maintain it. But that would be my main consideration and thought, um, sort of choosing between the two. Anthony Rouse says, "Hi Mark, can you advise on O-ring kits for use on general air components, regulators, BCD cylinders, etc., please?" Um, yeah, so O-rings, okay, so to start with, O-rings, I think, depending on where you live, um, where where I live, they um, they have a, I think it's called, I think it's the British Standard, and it's like three numbers. Um, so the most common ones are uh, 111s and 112s. The, the three numbers, I think are the like the internal measurements, the um, uh, the the diameter of the O-ring and and the the extent something like that. Um, I could be wrong, but the most common ones um, I, I have a handful of O-rings um, kept in a uh, in a box. So the most common ones for your um, for your cylinders, you get one one ones and one one twos. The one one twos are more what you find on your. Um, uh, DIN regulators. The 111s are what you tend to find on A clamp regulators, but sometimes they're 014s. I think those are the three, in my mind, like regulator to cylinder uh, attachment O rings. Um, so when you're looking at a set of regulators, that O ring, um, I mean, you, these all come in sets. So you get a box similar to that, that's like spaced up. Um, the actual ones usually have the the, the, the O-ring size and sometimes the use like printed out on them. So it's a bit easier for you to um, to sort of pick them out. Um, but yeah, the, the 111s and the 112s here in the UK, we tend to use the most. Um, and 014s are the really like skinnier ones that you get on the, um, I don't think I've got any donuts, um, but the the inserts into uh, into an A-clamp cylinder valve. Uh, otherwise, you get the really little dinky ones um, on, a, uh, on a high pressure swivel. Um, eh, eh. That one doesn't have any, this one does. So these tiny little O-rings, so these are uh, 003s. Um, if I can get this little guy off. 
these are quite useful to have from time to time. Ugh, he, he's just gonna stay on. Um, so this goes between your, um, your pressure gauge and the high pressure hose. So if you find it's leaking from there, it's quite often that it's one of these little O-rings that is um, just either worn out or whatever. Um, so it's quite handy to have some of those knocking around. And, uh, and yeah, they're normally um, uh, 003s. I think sometimes you can get 004s, um, but the more common size I believe is 003. Um, for your regulator hoses, uh, most 3 8 inch um, regulator hoses, these are 011s um, that go around here. This one, if, uh, if my close-up camera can see it, is a little bit ropey. Um, so if it's leaking from your first stage, I know I've just taken the O-ring out, don't worry. <clears throat> so if it's leaking from about there, then you'll need a, uh, an 011, an 11. Um, yeah, this one's a little bit ropey, which could lead to a, a small leak. Um, but yeah, that's usually the, uh, the size that you use on those. On the, on the other end of the, the high pressure hose, so that is a, a 12 because it goes 11 and then a 12. So this is 7 16th inch um, hose. So that's a, a 12, I believe. So those are the, probably the most common sizes or at least the ones that you as a, a diver in the field might need to change. There are others. So there's one on the inside here. Oh, I can't remember the size of that, but... Once, once you get into that, there, there are plenty of um, size charts uh, like out there, um, but those are probably the most common sizes. And if you're if you're like buying them, then yeah, a kit is is usually a, a good way to, um, to to get that foundation, the most basic sizes. They come in a few different materials. Uh, the most common is um, uh, is Buna or nitrile. So um, I think this is a Buna. Um, and they're, they're a good all-rounder, um, but if you're diving with like high oxygen percentages, then you want to go over to something like uh, Viton or poly, uh, polyurethane um, for like standard nitrox like below 40 percent um yeah buna or uh, epdm are usually the most the most popular and the the cheapest as well um but yeah um uh, have a look online uh there, there are plenty of those kits that uh, that should help you out but those are probably the most the most common sizes to uh, to swap out on a dive site and it really usually does come down to that one um either on your, uh, your DIN regulator or on your actual cylinder if it's a clamp. And that's it for another week. Uh, again, if you've got any questions, by all means, pop them down in the comments below. And if you use the Ask Mark hashtag, it makes it a lot easier for me to find it so you can get featured in the next show. Um, don't forget to head over to scubadivermag.com. Check out all the latest scuba diving news as well as gear reviews and travel reviews, all that kind of good stuff. We try and focus on a little bit of everything. Um, but yeah, head over to the website to check out more. And of course, like, share and subscribe, do all that social media stuff. Thank you for watching everybody and of course, safe diving.